So Tatiana, share a little bit about yourself, your family. Let introduce yourself a little bit. Hi, I'm Tatiana, and Tracy's wife. <laughs> That's my title. Um, I'm an English teacher. I have taught uh, for about 18 years, and right now I work for a Florida virtual school, so I work from home. And I enjoy doing that. And I have three kids, Ethan, who's 14, Caitlin, who's 12, and Adeline, who's 8. We've been hearing from some other people about their stories, and, and today we're looking at that God makes a way, that you know some of us have different paths. We don't all intersect God in, in the same way. For, for me, I went to church all my life. Um, my family was there. I was there all the time, and God intersected me there. But uh, your story is a little bit different than my story. How did God impact you? Okay, um, well, I'll start with my parents. Um, my dad is from Bermuda, but American citizen as well. So he met my mother, who was a Cuban refugee. She had defected from Cuba when Castro came into power. They met at college in West Palm Beach. Um, they got married and then moved to Bermuda, where my sister and I were born. Um, things were going fine for a while, but my mother had bipolar disorder, and so she was a little bit erratic. But when her father died, um, when I was about three, she um, kind of turned a corner and felt like it was my father's fault that she hadn't gotten to speak to him. And anyway, she took my sister and I and moved us to Virginia where she got increasingly more paranoid, where uh, she ended up getting a gun, and we ended up getting kicked out of our apartments and then living in hotels for a while because she thought people were trying to kill her. Um, finally, she ended up getting arrested and then institutionalized, and my sister and I were put in foster care until my father could come and get us. Um, up to that point, that lasted about five years, so I was about four or five years. I was about seven when she was arrested, and my dad had really wanted to reconcile with my mom during that time, but when he realized at this point he had to choose, um, and he decided to divorce her so that he could have custody of me and my sister. And so that, that was going well. Um, then she was getting help, and we went and lived with my grandparents because they wouldn't allow us to take us out of the country to Bermuda. Um, we were living with my grandparents until my dad could um, get things situated. So they brought my uncle to come stay with us. Uh, that brought some stability in my life because when I was living with my mom, it was very erratic. I didn't go to school very often, and um, just it was kind of chaotic. Um, and it was more stable with my grandparents. But um, my uncle was an alcoholic, and occasionally he was kind of um, violent as well. So there was a sense where things were better, but also it was all kept quiet. We weren't allowed to say anything to my dad or anything. And so underneath, there was just kind of this deception, this... Uh, the sense that I couldn't really trust adults in my life. So I had a lot of insecurity as a kid. Um, when I was 12, we finally moved back to Bermuda. And things were better when it was just my dad and my sister and I. And there were several times where I was uh, heard the gospel um, through Young Life and Word of Life. And I would be interested, um, but then it would kind of, you know, fade away. But it really um, wasn't until college that... Um, things changed for me. So, so that's how he kind of started your path. And, and where, where was that crossroad experience, that one time that you feel that this is where God intersected your life? Yes, so those previous encounters I had had with the gospel um, had touched me, but I felt like when I had started to pursue it that um, I was kind of told a lot of rules, to be honest. It was, you know, go to church, do this. And so I just wasn't, it just didn't mean anything to me. But when I was in college, I actually had a really uh, powerful encounter with God. So I was already in school. Um, in January, my roommate, who was also from Bermuda, we decided, um, we were living in North Carolina, we're going to drive to Ohio in January to go visit our cousin in the midst of a snowstorm. So it um, wasn't our smartest move. <laughs> um, so that day we're driving, and um, I fell asleep. And it was the middle of the night, I guess, because we were going to try to drive all the way through because we didn't know what we were doing. Anyway, she hit me, like woke me up, and she said, Tatiana, you need to pray because we're going to die. So that was a great way to wake up. <laughs> um, and I was kind of like, okay, I don't really know how to pray. So, okay, so I'll, sure, why not? I'll try. Um, but she was really scared because it was snowing really heavily. They weren't plowing the roads. Um, and if you've ever driven at night in West Virginia, maybe it's different. That was a while ago. Like, there was, like, no rails. I felt like we were going to fall off the mountain. Um, yeah, we were from Bermuda, so we had no skills. <laughs> anyway, I was like, God, help us get to a hotel. And 
Um, we ended up finding an exit. There was a hotel, and we got settled in for the night, and I was just laying there in bed, and, you know, I felt okay, but then all of a sudden, I just felt this fear, uh, this dread, and just kind of just kept on escalating, and I just couldn't, like, relax. I couldn't, and I just felt like something was sitting on my chest, and I was just really afraid, and um, I had never really felt anything like that before. Uh, I felt completely helpless. And so I just remember in that moment, I just cried out, and I was like, God, if you're there, please comfort me. And almost immediately, I felt like this peace come over me like a blanket, and I felt, I heard God say, it's going to be all right. Um, And then the next morning, I woke up, and I said to my friend, and her mom was a Christian, and I know she was praying for me, and I said, God brought me out here because he wants me to have a relationship with him. Mm. And so that was like the, the big encounter, but about a month later, and I actually realized um, it was 24 years ago yesterday. Because <laughs> I, awesome. I was like, oh, February 16th, 1995. So, cool. so 24 years ago yesterday, I read a book that my friend's mother had suggested for me. And it was somebody's testimony. Um, and it was just so powerful to me because in the testimony, he talked about his relationship with God and his presence and the satisfaction he had in God and God alone. And that was what I was wanting and and craving, was something I could trust in, something that was secure. Unlike a lot of the insecurities I had growing up, I wanted somebody that I could trust in and put all my faith in. And so that moment I said, this is it, God. I'm going to follow you 100%. So what about now? What, how has your life been different or what's happened since that, that point? Okay, well, I kind of mentioned in the first service, I was a bit intense at first <laughs> because for me, I was like, wow, this is truth. I've been looking for truth. Um, previous to that, my, my forays into truth had been more new age. I had been trained in transcendental meditation. That was my, what my father was into. I had did tarot cards. But the more I like delved into the new age world, the more I felt like, there were so much contradictions, and there's no sense of, like, it being truthful. So when I found what I, you know, truth, I was like, well, I'm going to do this 100%. So I was, like, threw away all my CDs. I stopped wearing makeup. I was, like, evangelizing anybody who moved. Like, I was <laughs> <laughs> annoying. Oh, I, I offended a lot of people. However, <laughs> on the other side, <laughs> there were people who who saw this big change in me and became believers, like I was able to share Christ with them. So God was able to use me even in my obnoxious state. Um, But over the years, I realized I was trying um, to earn my place with God. I wanted to feel secure, and security was a big deal for me because of the chaos of my childhood. And so I felt like if I was really good, then God would love me and I would be safe with him. But I think... um, so God allowed me to fail, really, multiple times and really helped me see that it's not about me. And probably one of the biggest things is when I became a Christian, I was like, okay, what's the hardest thing a Christian could do? I'm going to be a missionary. I'm going to suffer for Jesus. I'm going to go out and live in the tribes. Um, so I had an opportunity to go live in China for a year where I was teaching English in a Chinese boarding school. So I had these grand visions of I was going to be like Hudson Taylor, who's this amazing Christian missionary back in the 1800s. Look him up if you don't know who he is. But I just thought I was going to be awesome. I don't know. I thought if I was in a foreign country that I was going to be, like, the best Christian ever. Well, it turns out that when you remove all my comforts, I'm actually a a worse human being than I am (laughs) normally. So that year was very humbling. There was a lot of, I think I realized, I was like, I don't have what it takes to be this great Christian. And is he going to still love me even if I can't perform the way I feel like I should? Um, and so if that was really kind of the beginning of the lessons that I'm still learning every day is that he's enough and I don't have to be enough because he is. Amen. And I'm every day trusting and letting him lead and guide instead of having this grand vision of how he's going to use me. I'm letting him plan that out one day at a time, even though that means a lot of humbling at times. Amen. Thank you so much, Tatiana. This is my story. This is my song, praising the Savior all the day long. You know, we've been looking at different stories, and and what we're using this series for, if you haven't been here, is we're taking big things that we know or we've heard about God, and then 
And then looking to God's Word and finding the stories that demonstrate that because that's how things are. That's testimonies. That's, that's saying God is something and this is how we know God is something. Not, not that just you said it or pastor said it or, or somebody preached it on TV, but this is how we know it because we can find it in God's Word. We find proof in God's words, the stories and the people's life and their testimonies that have been written down in God's Word. And so, so the first week, two weeks ago, we learned an amazing truth or, or the stories behind that God is all-powerful. That God is all-powerful. And we, we looked at the stories where God interrupted one of the most powerful forces on this world, whether it was a sea or an ocean or a river, and he spoke a word, he waved a hand, and those seas parted or they calmed. God is in control of the most powerful force on this earth because he is more powerful than anything, that he is all-powerful, that at a very word those seas parted. And then last week, Tracy did an amazing job reminding us again that God is love. And when we look at even some of the rest of these that we'll look through these stories, that we looked at through the lens that God is love, we understand them in a greater way. And he used a beautiful story in God's word of the, the Good Samaritan. Where the, the Good Samaritan was, 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 was Jesus, symbolized Jesus, our saving power. The person that saved us, just like we sang, he rescued us out of the pit and put us into his promise. And so, so we then are, are those that have been saved, believers that were rescued out of the pit and placed into a, a place where we can grow and we can heal. And that's the church. And then after we heal and God has worked on our lives here, we are called to be the church in someone else's life and show God's love to them as God brings them here and they have need. This week, and let me tell you, it, you, if, if you want to at some point raise your hand, interrupt me, you can, because I'm pumped. I can't tell you. I, there hasn't been a sermon in a long time that I've been this excited about. I was, as, as God was speaking it to me, and as I was writing things down, and I was figuring out what God wanted me to say today, my heart was just burning inside of me. And on Thursday, I wanted to call every single one of you and say, church is happening tonight. Get here, because I can't hold it in. And so if I get going too fast, and I likely had to do sometimes, just raise your hand and say, Robert, slow down. And I'll slow down, all right? But, but what we're going to learn today that we've been singing about and, and Tatiana explained with her testimony is God makes a way when there seems to be no way. If you would have told somebody the, the history of Tatiana, you would have never thought she would have gone from tarot cards and all these other influences and nobody in her life, very few people in her life speaking Christ into her. And she became a Christian. And she's doing an amazing things through all the many things that she does here at this church and in her home and in, through the ministries and the workplace that she, God has placed her. She's being, making an impact there because God makes a way when there seems to be no way. And so, as I, was, as I was thinking, what story in God's Word best illustrates this idea that God is sovereign above all else, that if He has a plan and purpose for your life, He's going to bring it to fruition? Let's, let's see if maybe you know it and I can go home right now. So what story, uh, and you can go home, I guess, too. I guess that's the better part for you. Um, what story in God's Word do you think illustrates God will make a way? Joseph, man, you guys either are really smart, you've read my notes, or it just is that obvious. And it is. To me, there is no better story, there is no greater story than that. But as I was thinking about this idea of God will make a plan, you know, I thought about this, this, this idea of um, the most amazing miracle that I think God does every day is that he engineers his plan to come fruition even though there, it's in the midst of seven billion people that each have free will. There, I, it's, it's amazing to, to think that God can engineer things and put people in place even though they don't know they're being put in place and they don't know they're being used by God and they probably would choose not to maybe if they, didn't, if they had that, but, but they had free will. And even in the midst of that free will, God can still bring about his plan 
To me, I kind of thought about it this way. I love to do Legos growing up. Anybody love to? I still love to do Legos, let's be honest, all right? But Legos, so, so imagine this, that, that I have this huge garbage bag that fits in those garbage cans back there, those black bags, and somebody has thrown millions of pieces of Lego pieces in this bag, and they've given me a task. Build the Eiffel Tower one piece at a time with those Legos. And all I can do is close my eyes and reach in and grab the first thing and then pull it out and put it on the bottom. And then reach down and grab another piece and put it on top of that. What would be the chance that I could build the Eiffel Tower that way? I would say zero. Zero chance that I could build the Eiffel Tower that way. But God, with all these moving pieces in the world, still is able to bring out his plan time and time again. Our God is amazing, and he's sovereign. It also reminded me of kind of the science fair project days. Anybody in those days right now? I mean, during science fair projects that parents get to do. Um, <laughs> let's be honest. Come on. All right? That's that parents get to do. Um, we, we, we try to control the variables, right? We, we try to have as many controlled variables and have one thing that changes so that we can test our results. But even when we do our best as non-scientists here, um, do our, our best at doing that, we still struggle with getting vi viable results, right? And, and nothing, nothing is, is static. All of us have the ability to change our mind, our will, our plan at any time because God has given us that free will. And even in spite of that, God makes a way. So let's look at our story. Um, we're going to be looking in Genesis. The story is found in Genesis 37 through 50. So open your Bibles to Genesis 37. Uh, we're not going to read every single thing. What we're going to look at is five crossroads. Five important crossroads in the life of Joseph. The dangers that are found in that crossroads. Because what happens at a crossroad? You get to decide which way you go. Do you keep going straight, left, or right, or turn around? And so Joseph encountered these five crossroads, and there are dangers, but there are also promises in God's word that helps us through them. You see, in this story, we see how God can make a way when there seems to be no way. God's path from promise to plan isn't always comfortable, and it's filled with off-ramps and pitfalls, but when we persevere, and see it to its conclusion, then we get to be part of the redemption story that God is painting on his canvas. So let's get started with these five crossroads. The first one I call the promise. The promise, and that's found in Genesis 37, verse 2 through 11. Genesis 37, verse 2 through 11. Let's read it together with me, please. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilbah and Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report to them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all the other brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I've dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. Who says behold? But I guess he did. And behold, your sheaves gathered around him and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Why does my iPad turn? Behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brother were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. If you're, if you're a believer, there is going to be a crossroad where you encounter God, where God speaks to your heart, God tells you to do something, 
explains the gospel to you and you respond and then, and then you start this journey of life. But there is a point where we all come to where we have to understand the promise of God. The promise that God promises to be with us. He promises to give us salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ, and that He has a purpose and plan for each and every one of us. God, we are one of those Lego pieces and God is building the Eiffel Tower, but God has the ability to do so. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it says this, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Here's an amazing thought. God has a plan for your life, but it only comes to fruition when it is wrapped up in His story, His plan. You can try to do it on your own, but it will not happen without it being engulfed in His story. And so what's the danger? What's the danger that we see at this beginning part, this first crossroads for Joseph here? I think the first danger that Joseph encountered was pride. I mean, listen to what, he's, listen to what he was doing. I mean, there's already tension between he and his brothers, and I'm sure he knew that. He has walking around in this beautiful coat that nobody else has. His, his dad loves him better than the others and tells everybody about it. Look how good my son Joseph is, right? And then he has a dream. Wisdom at this point would say, don't share it with your brothers. They're not going to like it, and they're not going to like you even more. But there was something, God, he was still stuck in that. He was so excited. God spoke to him, wow, this is a dream. I thought, this is awesome. And so he shared it with them. And it probably wasn't the best move for him. A lot of times at the beginning of our relationship, we come in gung-ho and there's nothing wrong with that. But the danger is that it becomes more about us than about God. The danger is that we, we think, look how great we are. and we, like God has given me a purpose and a plan and let's go out and save the world. And that's what God wants us to do, but he wants us to do it in his way. And I do not believe Joseph going to his brothers and riling them up like this twice was probably God's best for that. And so there's a little bit of immaturity. There's a little bit of pride at the beginning of this crossroad. But even in the midst of that, God still continues to work out His plan for Joseph and for the world. And so, even though pride was a struggle for him at this point, God continues His story. And the next crossroad that, Jesus, that Joseph comes to, I call the pit. Let's read about the pit. Genesis 37, 18 through 28. So, Joseph is coming to his brothers um, in the field, and it starts here in verse 18. It says, They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then he will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands by saying, let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty, there was no water in it. We'll come back to that. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat and looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, ball, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Joseph said to his brothers, what profit, or Judah said to his brothers, what profit is this if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hands be upon him for he is our brother, our own flesh. Yeah, right. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. 
The pit is that place that none of us wants to be. And many times it does happen not long after the promise. When God intersects your life and you turn your life over to Him and you take another step like we talk about here, you take another step in your growth, many times Satan comes against it and puts the pit in front of your face. Let me, let me illustrate it this way. Um, there was a good friend of mine that we'd kind of grown up in the same church. Her dad was the music minister of uh, growing up, and, and so I was very active with them and, and just a really good family. And um, I went off to seminary, and after I was there a year or so, she called me and said, Robert, I'm, I'm feeling God calling me to seminary. What do you think? I said, well, first, I'm not God. I'm not going to answer whether you should come or go, but let me tell you this. What I've seen since I've been here is that almost all of us, almost all of us, after we came to seminary, we have dealt with some impossible thing, some tragedy in our life, some difficult in financing, maybe a difficult in a marriage that was going on. Um, there were, I saw friends of mine that came to seminary married and after a year or so left unmarried because God, Satan had got a hold of their relationship. And that, that threw them into a pit in their life. And so I said, listen, if you come, just, just know that something might happen. And Satan's going to test whether this is true and real in your life and whether you're going to persevere or you're going to give up. And so she decided and she came. And about a year, uh, six, six to seven months after she came, her mother was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And she came to me weeping and said, Robert, what do I do? I feel like I need to go home and take care of my mom. I need to be here during this time. But I, but I also felt like God wanted me to be here. And I said, I'm not going to answer that again for you, but, but I did tell you that if you took this step, that you were going to come against something that will try to discourage you and take you from God's purpose for your life. So I would say stick it out. Love on your mom however you can. Go home whenever you can. But don't give up on what God planted in your heart and the calling in your life. And she is now uh, an amazing woman married to a pastor here in uh, not far, Mount Dora, I think. Um, and she's doing amazing things. I see her online, just things she's doing for uh, Florida Baptist Children's Home in different areas. And she's really serving the Lord in so many ways because she stayed faithful. She didn't let the pit get her away. There's a scripture, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, that says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understandings. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make straight your path. You see, when Satan or life or sin put roadblocks in our path, we have to see them as opportunities for God to prove this Scripture and to do the straightening in our lives. The danger of the pit is fear. Whenever we get thrown into a pit, none of us like to be there, and many times it leads to fear. But we know, because of God's promises, that faith and love conquer fear. Faith and love conquer fear. And so whether, whether you find yourself right now going through a pit in your life, that you felt like you were doing something for God. Maybe you've started coming to church again for the first time. And now all of a sudden things are falling apart in your life. And you feel like there's, there's, there's this ground above you. You're never going to get out of that. One thing I saw in that scripture I said we're going to come back to. Remember it says, they threw him into the pit and there was no water there. We just kind of gloss over that. But a lot of times those pits would have been filled with water. And so if that would have been that way then he would have struggled to stay afloat and maybe would have died waiting in that pit. And so even in the pit, God was there with him. Just like God is there with you as you go through your pits of life. The next thing is the pit stop, is what I'm calling it. All right, the pit stop. Let's find out what this is about. Genesis, we're gonna skip Genesis 38. And like I said, if you wanna go, and, and I, I encourage you to read the whole story, Genesis 37 through 50. Um, if you want to skip 38, you can because it's just weird. Just telling you. Now, you wanna, now you're going to go home and read it. That's okay, but it's weird. 
Um, just didn't think, I don't know why the Bible chose to tell us that, but it did. Okay, so but starting in verse chapter 39, verse 1, follow with me. Now Jesus had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in the house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was, was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, he loves that word, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in his house, and he has he's put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. But one day, when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Jew to laugh at us. He came into me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that, I lifted up my voice and cried out. He left his garment beside me and fled and got out of his house. Then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came, in me, came to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way, this is the way your servant treated me? His anger was kindled. And, as jo and Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, the place where the king's prisoner was confined, and he was in that prison. This is the point that God spoke to me something different than I can ever remember hearing. Um, you know, I, I've read this story. I've probably preached this story before at some point. Um, but this, all of a sudden, it was like a light bulb went on, and my heart started to jump. And because I'd always thought, what was, what was the greatest danger while he was in what I'm calling the pit stop of Potiphar's house? What was this greatest danger? And it looks like from this passage that his greatest danger was sexual temptation, right? That this woman was calling to him, trying to entice him into her, and that was a danger. But I think the greater danger is what I'm calling apathy. The greater danger in this pit stop of Potiphar's house is apathy. And let me explain it this way. We're understanding this, this concept that God has a plan for Joseph. That God put a promise first in his heart. And then he brought a, a pit into his life to, to strengthen him and to move him to the next thing that God wanted for him. To engineer the circumstances of life to get him where he needed to be. And then he brought him into a comfortable place where he was used by God to do good things. It says that he took over the house of Potiphar because God blessed him. Everything Joseph did, God put favor on. And Potiphar saw that and so he said, hey, it's all yours. You do it. You manage everything. I'll sit back and enjoy the favor that you're incurring. And you know what? He could have just stayed there the, probably the rest of his life. It was a good life. He was a head of a, of a wealthy man's house. He, I'm sure he didn't have to worry about food. 
He didn't have to worry about provision, and, and God was using him. He was, God was being blessed. But that wasn't God's final plan for Joseph. And sometimes, sometimes we enter into apathy. We enter into this pit stop in our life where we just sit and soak and we're not doing anything for God. We're not taking another step. We might be faithful in what God has told us up to this point. We might be doing good things. But God has said, I have another step for you. This isn't your final place. And so the danger is just to sit back and be comfortable. The danger for you and me is the same. You could come to this church for 20 years and sit there and never take another step for God. And I'm going to tell you something. Apathy has set in. You could be reading your Bible. You could be praying. You could be doing some of these things. But if you're not looking for the next step, if you're not looking to grow more and more every day, then this is where we just get comfortable. We sit back because the air condition works and the seats are semi-comfortable. And Robert only preaches long every once in a while. And today's that day. Just kidding. Here we go. The pit stop. See, the scripture in 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And so as temptation comes, whether it's a sexual temptation that he encountered and God gave him away by just running, that's what God says about sexual temptation. Flee it, get away from it, run away from it. But the even greater temptation was for him to sit still and be comfortable with where he was, but God said no. And so to get him out of there, God brought about this circumstance with Potiphar's wife and this false accusation that led him to prison. And that's our next crossroad. The crossroad of the prison. Let's read about it. Genesis 39, just this next verse, 21. It says this. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Sound familiar? Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. But some time after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And the Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined, God engineering circumstances. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody. And one night, they both dreamed. The cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream. And each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, Why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, We have bad dreams. And there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, This is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Now only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house." For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. 
When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket, there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree and the birds will eat the flesh from you. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all of his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. The danger in the prison. What do you think the danger in the prison is? Imagine yourself being Joseph. What what would you be feeling? What could you be feeling? Because remember, these, these guys in God's Word, they're not superheroes. They're men and women just like us. They have feelings just like us. They're not perfect just like us. And so, What do you think, if that were you, what would you be feeling? Resentment? Doubt? Anger? I mean, why? Like, what did I do? I mean, why am I back in the pit, God? What why am I here? I mean, I've I've been faithfully serving you. I even ran from sexual sin, and God, I did what you wanted me to do. So why am I here, God? Have you ever been there? Where something happened so bad in your life, or maybe you felt it was that bad? And you have this fear and this anger at God. Like, God, why me? I mean, I'm I'm trying to follow you. I'm reading my Bible. I'm going to church. I'm trying to do the right thing with my family. And now I have to encounter this again. I'm back in the pit. And anger sets in. And we always read Joseph like he says, oh, he was was fine with it. I can't imagine that he was fine with it. There, there was that, but, but even so, he still continued to do what God was and be blessed by God because God is not about our circumstances. It's about his plan for our life that he's working out. Isaiah 55, 8, 9 says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declare the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I mean, imagine imagine if you would have given into temptation and still been in Pharaoh's house. I mean, in Potiphar's house. And then these men are thrown into prison and no one's there to interpret their dreams. And that guy rises to power. And we're going to find out later that he does fulfill his promise to Joseph. But, But imagine if Joseph wasn't in the prison And he didn't have that opportunity to speak into the life of somebody that was in Pharaoh's court. So then then he could have impact into Pharaoh's court. And eventually that we learn, we're not going to, we can't read everything, but Joseph rises to power because he interprets some of Pharaoh's dreams. You see, the reason why prison bothers us so much, and myself included, is that our vision is limited. And our thoughts are selfish. Let's, let's be real. We're more concerned about our own comfort and what is good for me today. And if it doesn't look good, then it must not be good. And not realizing that maybe God throwing us in a prison so that we can be at a crossroads to meet somebody that will forever impact our life. Or have an encounter that changes our life forever. See, the thing is, we can't see everything like God does. We don't know His ways. His ways are higher than our ways, and so we just have to trust Him, even when we're thrown into the prison. The last thing, the last thing is what I call the plan. So we're going to skip ahead in the story. We're going to go to chapter 45. Chapter 45. And see, in the chapters in between, Jesus Uh, Joseph, why do I keep saying Jesus? Joseph um, has an opportunity to interpret the dreams for Pharaoh. 
And these dreams basically tell them that there's going to be a famine in the land. There's going to be seven years of famine. But before the seven years of famine, there's going to be seven bumper crops, seven years of bumper crops. And so even after they interpret it, they're like, well, what do we do with that? And Joseph, in his wisdom that God has given him, says, let's take during those seven years, let's store up as much grain as we can so that we will be able to survive and thrive during the lean years. And so Pharaoh goes, that's a good idea. And you seem to be the man for it. You got it. So Joseph rises to power. He's second in command. And they, they collect so much grain that not only can they feed the people of, of Egypt, there are people coming from all over the land in that day. And they are trying to purchase some of this grain so that they can survive this terrible famine that's going throughout the land. And in the process of this, Joseph's family is struggling with this famine. And so Joseph's father sends his brothers to get some grain from Egypt. And this encounter happens that, that Joseph recognizes his brothers, but the brothers don't recognize him because he's been Egyptified. He's probably got the hair slicked back and maybe a nice little goatee going on and the makeup on the face, whatever they're doing in Egypt days. But he's, he doesn't look like Joseph to them anymore. And they thought he was long God and long dead anyways. And so, so they just didn't recognize him. And Joseph maybe in a little weakness puts them to the test to see if maybe they have grown, maybe they've matured, they've become different men in these years that have gone by. But ultimately, we come to this spot in our story. We come to the culmination of the story where Joseph stands before his brothers. And in Genesis 45, it says, it recounts the story this way. Then Joseph could not control himself before all who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into slavery. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and a lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Do you see an amazing level of growth in Joseph's life? That pit, that pit stop, that prison had grown him into the man that God wanted him to be, and he was right where God wanted him. He was second in command in one of the greatest kingdoms of all, the kingdom of Egypt. And he wasn't even Egyptian. And more importantly, God realized that it wasn't for that alone. He was there to save the world. He was there to save the Jewish people because it says here, now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years and there are yet five years in which there will be neither prowling nor harvest. And God sent me here before you to preserve you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. Joseph came to understand that his story wasn't about him at all. His story was only what it was because it was tied into God's story. Romans 8.28 says this, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. 
for those who are called according to His purpose. You see, when God's purpose becomes our purpose, we're able to see His plan and be humbled that we get to be part of His story or history. But I like to say it, His story because ultimately history is His story that He's writing. It's His canvas that He's painting. And we get to be part of that when we tie our lives, when we follow His lead, when we learn, we grow from, we grow from our mistakes, we don't let the pits and the pitfalls and the pit stops of life get us down but we always focus on what God is doing. Here's one last story for you. God sent Jesus as the promise one. He humbled Himself and came down to this pit. Satan offered Him a kingdom on earth. The disciples asked Him to save Himself, but He refused to take a pit stop and settle for an earthly kingdom. The rulers of the earth threw him in prison and tortured him with an inch of his life, but yet he was willing to go to the cross and freely give up his life so that he could fulfill the Father's plan. You see, these crossroads are not only in Joseph's life. Jesus encountered these crossroads as well. And I believe each And every one of us, if we are following the Lord, will encounter them. So I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know, maybe you've never even encountered the promise. or Maybe you've never heard about Jesus and what He wants to do with your life and how He wants to save you. This is the day to do it. This is the day at least to talk to somebody about it. We'll have elders and our prayer team up front And they would love to talk to you about this is the greatest thing. This is the first step. This is the most important thing that you will ever do with your life is getting plugged into understanding and being part of God's story and His plan for this world. Maybe maybe you've done that, but things have come against you. Now you're just frustrated. You don't don't understand. You thought it was going to be easy after you accepted Christ. But God never promises that. He just promises to be with us and walk with us through these crossroads. And help us make good decisions. Maybe you are, maybe you're at a pit stop in your life. Maybe you haven't taken another step in years. Maybe you've been coming to church, maybe reading the Bible a little bit, but you've not taken your next step in years. And I don't know what that is for you, but God does. And maybe He's going to use circumstances in your life to push you, to get you uncomfortable. But the goal is to get you to the next step in your life to get you where you need to be so that you can be part and on the way to fulfilling God's plan for you. Maybe you're in prison. Maybe things are really, really rough right now and you don't see a way out and you're actually a little frustrated that, God, why am I here? I don't get it. I mean, I I keep running into these same things, but but God is saying, be patient. My ways are higher than your, your ways and I know what I'm doing, so trust me. Because ultimately, God's going to bring out His plan. Ultimately, Jesus and God win. If you ever want to do a study on Revelations, always go into it this thought. The main thing you need to learn about Revelations, Jesus wins. And because He wins, we win. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we are, um, we are amazed this story, this, this should never have happened. How in the world did you, did, you, did you get a boy from a field to the palace of the Pharaoh? And with all these roadblocks, all these things that were thrown in front of him, and, and his own imperfection and his own sin that he was dealing with, I'm sure. But in spite of that, in spite of that, you worked in his life. And you brought about your plan and you saved the people of Israel and many others because of your plan for his life. So God, sometimes I, I, I wonder what my final plan is too. And all I can do is to be faithful to be doing what you call me to do now and looking for opportunities to take that next step. So Father, I pray that you would help each and every one of us to be in that same path, looking no matter where we are, 
to see what you have in store for us. And when we can't see, then we have faith. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.